Hey, folkies, do you want to learn the tune? Do you also maybe want to hear what is the difference between Baroque music and Swedish folk music? Because that's a question I got several times, or people just saying, well, Swedish music is nice, but it reminds me a lot of Baroque music, and I've been thinking that too. So why is that? Why is there a resemblance? And is there actually a strong difference in style between the two? Spoiler alert, yes there is. And how can I adapt my playing to sound more folk? Or actually more baroque? What are the things that differentiate them and how can I navigate that? And for answering all these questions, we will use the tune I just played. We'll learn the tune and look at many details that can drive you more towards the folky side or the baroque side, depending on what you want. So why do so many Swedish folk tunes, especially polskas, sound quite baroque to our ears? Why are they kind of similar in the style or in the feeling? Well, simply because Polskas are a very old type of tune and they've been popular for centuries now in Sweden. And they were already around during the Baroque era, alongside menuets, quadrilles and marches. The Polska you heard in the intro and which we're gonna learn in a minute was collected by Sven Donat, a musician and soldier. He lived during the second half of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s in the province of Småland in a village called Ormesberga. So there are good chances that the Polska is from that place. But Donat didn't transmit to us just one tune. He was actually one of the earliest collectors of Swedish folk music. He wrote down a full notebook of tunes. 237 tunes, to be exact, and more than half of these were polskas. The notebook was revised and published in 1912 by Olof Andersson, and since then, several polskas efter Sven Donat have been known again and played by folk musicians. But if these tunes were already played back then in the Baroque era, why would we want to play them more folk and less baroque? Well, that's not what I want to give you as a message in this video. What I'm trying to do is to give you a global understanding of how the style of baroque music, which we know a little bit about because there are people doing research on that, differs from how we play these tunes in the folk world nowadays. And sometimes it is the same Polska, so this Polska could be very much played in a Baroque way or in a modern way, because it is still a tune that is played today. And what is the folk style of today? That's also a very <laughs> complicated question to answer, because there is not one Swedish style of folk music, you know? There are many prominent musicians, and when you look at a group of them, you will see many differences but you will also find many similarities and you can crisscross what you analyze and find a kind of general style of today. So I'm just gonna give you a few tips about how it can sound like when you go a bit more in a direction and when you go a bit more in the other direction and then you pick and choose what you want. Oh, by the way, before I forget, <laughs> I was gonna forget that, this tune is now called Do Not Glömda. So, The Forgotten One by Donat. Not composed by him, but collected by him. And why is it called The Forgotten One? I don't exactly know, but I am guessing that it gathered that name along the way when it was kind of rediscovered after it was published in 1912. So either in that edition or probably a bit later on, it was nicknamed The Forgotten One by folk musicians. So I guess the title is quite recent, because in the original notebook by Sven Donat, it is just called Polska. 
It is the number 118 in the notebook, if you really need to know, but personally I think that Donat Glumda is a much better name than a number. It goes in D major, it is in 3-4 like all Polskas, pretty much. And I usually play it like a round Polska, so 3-1 Polska. But you could also play it as a slang Polska if you prefer, then the style will be a little bit different than how I play it. A part. One, two, three. that there were lots of ornaments already. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's talk about double stops. This tune is your perfect entry point into double stops if you are not used to them. Because you can pretty much have open strings all the time. <laughs> it's very easy for that. So the easiest you can do is just use D first, D string. <laughs> Then A string, keep the E then, and same thing again, basically when you do the second half of the A part. Then you can spice up your double stops a lot. So... Releasing the tension with the D and the C sharp with putting a E on the D. Normally in folk music we like when there is friction, so there is no problem actually about keeping the D drone. It's a nice little bagpipe effect if you want. Um, but just here, just having this kind of little phrase and release when you land on the D to have the octave is very typically Scandinavian. It's like all over Norwegian music and very common in Sweden too. Here instead of the open string, you could keep the D from before. And you will end up with a very nice third, but also a little bit of friction with the little second there between the D and the E, which is again something we really like. We like to have the friction with the drone, so it's a very nice feeling. And we are in D major, so having a more D is always nice. Then for the two last bars, you can of course use the open E, but you can also have an E that is lower. So on the D string, either you keep it or you release, and you keep the D again. Here, maximal friction with the G sharp and the A that you release with double A. E, D. Here, actually, all the choices that I just mentioned are working in folk music, but some will sound more folk while others will have a bit more of a baroque feeling. Basically, the more you change your chords to follow the melody bit by bit, the more you will sound baroque. Whereas if you keep your drone, so if you keep your open strings all the way, you will sound way more folk. <laughs> work.
works very well, very folky. Now let's talk about ornaments. That's kind of the first layer of what you can do to sound more Scandi folk and less Baroque. I mean, ornaments in general are very prominent in Swedish and Norwegian and many other types actually of folk music. And it's often one of the first things that people like notice when they look a little bit at technicality of the musician. And it's true that they are important because for example, this blouse, if it would not have all the nice embroidery, it would just be a black blouse. This is what makes it like pop and interesting to look at. It's a little bit similar, at least at first, when you look at ornaments. This A part with a more baroque type of ornaments would have slightly late drills that accelerate towards the end. For example, this kind of drills or mordens that would be less of a texture, like in a more modern folk style, but more of an actual note, a bit clearer maybe. So, maybe something like that. direction. Whereas in Swedish folk music we tend to have our ornaments such as drills and mordens more like early in a note and maybe we have another ornament later on. And the most common ornament in Swedish folk music, at least according to me, or like one of the most common ornaments, is what I call the Swedish drill. Video about ornaments more in detail if you're interested. But basically the Swedish drill is when you have a melody going up and you are on a finger, for example your first finger, you drill with your second finger and you land on that drilling finger. Whereas a usual drill, you will be on your basis finger and you decorate with the upper finger but then you release it and you stay with your first finger. So the Swedish drill is very often, as I said, when the melody is going up, so for example We do a mordent or a short drill and we land on the note. So here in our A part we could have... And you see I do it in the beginning of the note because that's the note I land on. And then the note is long. And maybe I then add a second ornament later on in the note, usually at the under division. For example, I could have a lift of my finger. But it's very fast. So... For example, a third possibility is to do something more like with the bow. So this is usually with double stops. It's very hard to do on just one string. It is that instead of just going straight with your bow, you will do kind of a wave with your bow. So you will like dig into the string a bit more. This is also very common. Whoa, this kind of thing. And it can be combined with one or both of the two first ones. So if I take this little um, first bar, maybe the two first bars, and I put some of these ornaments into those two bits, you will hear that it sounds very different than the Baroque version. That's also an ornament. You start on two strings, or one, and then you put on the other one. Once more. taken one at a time, maybe they are similar to the Baroque ornaments or to other types of ornaments, but all put together they are really typical, they become really typical of Swedish folk music. So my tip to you who are navigating between different styles or like exploring, like coming from one style, maybe classical, and exploring folk music or the reverse or 
with other styles than the two that we're talking about in this video, actually. I don't know, jazz and Bulgarian folk music, or I don't know what. It is to take a piece of music that is not too specific, or that maybe feels a little bit in between two things, and, you know, try to orientate your ornaments into one or the other direction. It is a little bit like picking up an accent or a slang, working on your slang or accent while you are speaking a language. Even if you say the absolute same sentence to your grandma, your banker, and your lover, and your friends from childhood, you're not gonna use the same inflections, maybe not exactly the same vocabulary, and definitely not the same position of your voice. And you probably change between those slight differences without even noticing. And it's just about practicing these so that on your instruments these kind of changes also happen and you can easily navigate between them. And part B. We're gonna be a lot on the E string this time. One, two, three. that we have two new bars and the rest is recycled from the A part. Swedish people have always taken recycling seriously. Well, I have no idea about real life actually, but in case of music, definitely since the Baroque era at least. And double stops again. Here again it's gonna be very easy. We're gonna have for the two new bars basically an A string. Open A. A all the way. And then for the two remaining bars, we can recycle the double stops from the A part, as it's the same melody anyway. So either the E or the E. You know. And with all the details you might want. Now let's get nerdy again about those differences, subtle things that you can work on to really differentiate a baroque style from a Scandinavian folk music style. So we talked about ornaments as a bit of the icing on the cake, now let's get into the cake itself. A big difference between the baroque cake and the Swedish folk music cake is that the baroque cake has a lot more air, it's a more airy dough, more airy cake than the folk one. So in Baroque music, and also in classical music in general, you will lift your bow quite a bit from the strings. Whereas in Scandi folk music, we rarely do that. I mean, it happens here and there, but it's not common. This V part, with more lifting of the bow, would sound something probably like this. in a folk way, it would be more something like... You get it. I don't lift my bow. It's a little bit more like, you know, a bagpipe. We have, we have our friends the bagpipes, and those guys have a continuous sound all the time. And we are a bit like that. We want to be with the gang of the bagpipes and the hurdy-gurdies. We want to have something that is continuous sound. What will happen is that you will 
make your bow lighter, for example, when you change strings and this kind of things, but you will not lift it very, very rarely, except at the very last note, just to finish with your up bow and be up in the air and happy. But during the tune, eh, not really. And even less so when you have double stops, because you kind of keep that bagpipe effect of the drone going on. Especially in this B part, you have a lot of open A string that works very well, as we just saw. So for example... Going on, going on, going on, going on. It's a compact thing and we don't breathe in between. In a similar manner, also one of the things happening with our folk cake as opposed to the baroque cake is that we want more of an even dough. We don't want like full fruits inside the cake. If we want a fruit ingredient in our cake, then it's gonna be mashed and everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, it's more of a compact and one piece of thing. And what I mean with that is that we are not phrasing as much. I mean, we do a bit of phrasing in folk music, but really not as much as Baroque. Baroque is all about phrasing. And you have these beautiful things like you know, like with this very clear directions of bowing going somewhere, melody falling down, melody rising dramatically. We don't do much of that in folk music. Because when you are playing for dancing in a crowded environment, and probably with lots of people talking and drinking and laughing and jumping around and dancing, there's a lot of noise. So you are trying to get the maximal volume at all times and there is not much place for subtlety. <laughs> you can still have a lot of subtlety, for example with the ornaments and with how you play and all the variations you make, but the like, dynamics are just not as big. Of course, if you are not playing for dancing, but for a concert, then you will put lots more dynamics. But in general, we don't have this kind of big phrasings. This goes a bit together with the not lifting the bow. You don't like finish a part and lift your bow and go to the next part. You just keep it there and you kind of push through those long notes. You don't like rest on the long note, but you more like push through. And very often you will also start the next note a little bit early and then make an ornament to mark where the beat actually is. For example, if I take the first B part and I do the going back to the beginning of the second B part, did you hear that? Once more. and we mark the beat with a mordant instead of with the start of the notes. That's very, very common, this kind of anticipation of the next note. So... This. It's like you just don't release the energy. You just keep it, keep it, keep it until the next part. So Baroque music is all about phrasing, right? I remember working extensively on phrasing when I was playing a lot of Baroque music and it's very different than folk music. Not that we don't phrase anything in folk music, but Baroque music is way more... goes way further with this idea, <laughs> if you see what I mean. You have long lines and you have to lead your music somewhere. So, this B part could sound something like... With long lines that lead somewhere and a lot of breathing and a bow that is a little bit more on top of things and easy to lift and with a lot of space for breathing and air. For me, in general, my feeling about Baroque music, as soon as I take my bow, which is a Baroque bow, so it's 
quite practical when I want to switch, works very well for folk and baroque, is my hand automatically gets lighter, so I can phrase better and I can breathe easier. Whereas in folk music, I'm a bit more into the string, you know, it's a bit more... <clears throat> so what do you say? Do you think that you will play this tune more like a folk, modern folk tune, or more like a baroque folk tune? Something in between, something different? Let me know in the comments. I would really like to know what your style goes towards and also what you hear in this tune in general. I hope these little tips were useful to you. Let me know which one you use and if you play another instrument than a fiddle, a bowed instrument, let me know what techniques on your instrument work for having a different type of sound. You know, a little bit like the continuous bowing that I mentioned that is a bit more like a bagpipe or lifting the bow more if you want to have a more airy sound. These kind of things. I'm always very interested to hear those kind of technical little details. If you enjoy this type of content, well, you can go check the channel if you haven't yet. I make regular videos about Scandinavian folk music. It can be a bit more fiddle oriented or nickel harpa. If you have never heard what a nickel harpa is, well, go check the channel. You will have a good answer to that then. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Activate the bell to get the notifications. And if you think that this is really interesting and you would like to get sheet music or maybe my background life as a musician or just you want to support what I do here, you can do so on Patreon. And of course, a big thank you to the people who already support me on Patreon. Your help means that I can invest in like cameras and lights and a studio for recording. I am now in the studio again, which was temporarily out of use, kind of, and now is back into a useful uh, place and which I'm planning to use way more in the future. So if this sounds interesting, it will also be more developed on Patreon. That is all for me today. I will leave you now. Have fun with this tune, the little nerdy things and the historical considerations. And I will see you in the next video. Hey, Dora!